Hi, my name is Ken. And my name is Jason. And today we're reviewing Nexus, Nexus Ops. Nexusops was published in 2005 by Avalon Hill. Yep, uh, players in this game are actually uh, controlling several different corporations uh, who are vying, con vying for control of an alien moon which actually holds uh, a brand new fuel source uh, known as Rubium. And each individual game of Nexusops takes place around a monolith which is where the greatest concentration of Rubium can be found. Yep, in game, um, uh, players actually control different aliens that are found on this moon um, and the aliens help them to mine resources or control the other players in combat. So first of all, we're going to go over the components of Nexus Ops. So these are the uh, tiles for Nexus Ops. Uh, this is the monolith tile. There are some single hex tiles and double hex tiles. And this is one of the home base tiles. These are the cards. So these are the uh, mission cards, secret mission cards, and energized cards. These are the assorted cardboard bits. So we have uh, rubium mines, exploration tiles, and rubium tokens. These are the player figurines for the game. Uh, they come in green, red, blue, and yellow. And each one has a variety of the, uh, the different unit types. So these are, these are humans, fungoids, crystallines, rock striders, lava leapers, and rubium dragons. These are the reference charts for the game. There is one for each player color. And these are the dice. So now we're going to go through the setup of Nexus Ops. The first step is to randomly determine the starting player. Alright, so that's my two to your five, you'll be picking first. The starting player uh, picks their first color and then it goes around clockwise from there. So Jason, what color are you playing? I'm half tempted to pick green. I don't think you should do that, Jason. No, I don't think I should. I will go with, with yellow. Jason is then given the reference chart and all the pieces of the yellow player. Not surprisingly, I'm going to choose green. I also get the reference chart and all the pieces of the green player. The next step is to create the board. First, place the monolith in the center. Retrieve the six single hex tiles here. Shuffle them up and distribute them randomly around the monolith. Next, retrieve the two hex tiles from the box. Shuffle them up as well and distribute them randomly around the perimeter of the current board. Next, retrieve the uh, home base tiles of the starting players. You can tell the uh, different colors apart because the triangles will actually be the color of the player that is, uh, they are associated with. When placing the home base tiles on the board, they must be opposite to each other. So in a four-player game, the other two would go here. Shuffle the secret mission cards and the energized cards and place them at the top of the board. Place the mission cards up at the top of the board as well. You can shuffle them if you want, but that's just for posterity. They're all the same. Retrieve the square exploration tiles, shuffle them up a little bit, face down of course, and place them on every empty tile except for the home base tiles of the starting players and the monolith, like such. Next, place the mining markers, the rubium tokens, and the dice near the board so that all players can reach them. Next, distribute the starting amount of rubium to all players. The starting player gets 8 rubium, and each subsequent player will get 3 more. The second player will get 11, and if we had a third and fourth players, they would get 14 and 17, respectively. And now you are ready to play. There are six phases to a turn. First of all is deploy, then move, explore, fight, income, and draw. During the deploy step, players may actually purchase units according to the rubium cost listed on the reference sheet. Purchased units can be placed on any of the player's home base tiles. Next comes the move phase. During the move phase, each unit can move one hex unless otherwise noted on the reference chart. Once a unit enters a hex containing enemy units, its movement must end immediately. There are certain tiles around the board, in particular the lava tiles and the monolith tile, 
that certain units cannot access. The units are actually pictured on the tiles themselves, and they are listed on the reference chart. And finally, if your unit begins its turn in the same space as enemy units, it can still move, but it must end its move in a space you control or an empty space. It can't move from one contested area into another contested area. During the explore phase, if any of your units are on a hex with a face down exploration marker, you flip that marker over. If it shows a picture of a unit, place one unit of that type in your color on that hex. If it shows a mine icon, place one of that type of mine on the hex as well. And finally, remove the exploration tile. Next is the fight phase. During the fight phase, you conduct one round of combat in each contested hex. And that's each hex with units from more than one player. If there are more than two players with units in a hex, then you must choose one of those players as your opponent. Units attack in the order shown on the reference chart, starting at the right-hand side and ending at the left-hand side. Each player's units of that type actually attack simultaneously. For each unit of that type, you would roll one die, and if you achieve that unit's hit rating or higher, then the opponent must take one, one casualty of their choice. You are considered to have won the battle if you destroy all of the enemy units, and you lose the battle if all of your units are destroyed. In addition, if you lose a battle during another player's turn, you may draw one energized card. After the fight phase comes the income phase. During the income phase, you receive the amount of rubium listed on each mine tile, which is in a hex you control, which means there are no enemy units there, and that you have a human, fungoid, or crystalline in. Then finally is the draw phase. During the draw phase, you draw one secret mission card, and if you control the monolith, meaning you have units there and no one else does, you also draw two energized cards. Now if you control a ruby and dragon, at the end of your movement phase, you can actually have it breathe into an adjoining hex. If you wish to do this, simply announce the target hex and roll a die. If you get a 4 or higher, you choose a player with units in that hex, and that player must remove a unit from the hex. This is not considered to be a battle, however, so no energized cards that may be played before, during, or after a battle can be used. Energized cards can be gained in two ways. You gain one whenever you lose a battle during another player's turn, and you gain two if you control the monolith during your draw phase. The discard pile is actually reshuffled if you run out, so you will never run out of energized cards. And all energized cards will say when it can be played and what the, its effect is. And any energized card that says start of turn must be played during the deploy phase. Some of the energized cards will also be battle energized cards. They will specifically say battle on them and they will have red text. These cards will tell you exactly when they can be played. And in all cases, the attacker may always play cards first, then the defender, and then any other players going clockwise from the defender. So players not even in the battle may play energized cards on the battle if they wish. Secret mission cards are gained during the draw step and are kept hidden in your hand. Mission cards are always available to be played. Both types of mission cards may only be played during your own turn, and only one mission or secret mission card may be played in response to winning a battle. All other secret mission cards may be played as soon as you've achieved the goal which is listed. And once they are played, secret mission or mission cards are placed face up in your player area, and each one grants you the number of VP listed. As soon as you've gained 12 VP worth of mission and or secret mission cards, you win immediately. The game also ends immediately if a player is eliminated. A player is only eliminated, however, if their last unit has been destroyed, they don't have enough rubium to purchase another unit, and they don't have any cards that will grant them rubium. If a player is eliminated, then the remaining player with the highest VP total wins the game. So this is the start of the game. Uh, I was chosen as the, as the starting player, so I will go first. Because he's going as starting player, I'm going to organize all my dudes in a neat little fashion. So we start off with the deploy phase. So during the deploy phase, I choose to spend all eight of my rub rubium to place four humans. Which I place on the hexes of my base. Next is the movement phase, and I choose to move one of my pieces into this top. Next we do the exploration phase, so I flip over this tile. It shows a two rubium mine, 
So I place a two mine there and remove the exploration tile from the game. There are no battles right now because I'm the only person with units on the board. Next I gain my income. So I have one human on all four of these spaces, meaning that I gain nine rubium altogether. Finally, during the draw step, I draw one secret mission card, and then my turn is over. All right, now it's time for Zyborg Technologies. First, I get to purchase units. I'm gonna purchase three humans for six, and another human and a fungoid for another five. During the movement step, I move this human here, and this fungoid here. For the exploration step, I reveal this tile, I receive a crystalline, and a one-point mine. I remove this tile, and let's see what my fungoid found. I found rock strike. There are still no battles going on, because this is just the first round of the game. And now I gain Rubium for each mine I control, for a total of 8 Rubium. Finally, I draw a secret mission card, and it's Jason's turn again. So we're a few more turns in now, and it is the start of my turn. So at the start of my turn, I'm going to uh, play a few energized cards that I've collected. First of all, I play Scattered Rubium, which gains between one Rubium for each space I control outside of my home base, which at this point is five. Next, I play Crystal Cloud, which allows me to destroy one Fungoid, so... No! And I also play Forced March, which allows me to choose two of my units that can move one extra space this turn. Well, first of all, I'm going to buy a Rubium Dragon. Yeah, I saw that coming. Next is move units. I choose to move my Rubium Dragon 2 using Forced March. And I choose to move this Crystal and an extra movement as well. I'm going to send this guy in here. I'll move this guy. He's moving up. And I think that's going to be it for my movement. Alright. So at the end of my movement phase, I choose to breathe with my Rubian Dragon. Oh! And he is going to uh, breathe into the monolith. No! So I roll the die. Unfortunately, I did not get a four or higher, so nothing happens. Oh, good. Kenny is safe for one more turn. We'll see about that. Yes, we will. So next is the exploration phase. So I gain a one mine and a fungoid here. Next is fighting. So there is only one battle which is going to occur. So did you have any cards you want to play at the start of the battle, Kenny? Uh, no, that's fine. Okay. In that case, my Rock Strider is going to attack first. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, he misses. Next, Kenny's Crystalline gets to attack, and he hits on a 4+, plus because in the Crystal expires. Nope. All right. Then my Fungoid attacks, and unfortunately, I did not hit either. So neither of us win or lose this battle, because nobody's actually taken any casualties. <laughs> Next is the Income Step. So I gain 1, 2, 3... 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. And finally, for the draw step, I draw a secret mission card. It is now Kenny's turn. Alright, first off, I can purchase just new units. I'm also at the point now where I want a Rubium Dragon. No, you don't. No, I really do, man. And... Where are you gonna go? Let me see. Um... Oh, right, start a turn. 
I have an energy, uh, or a, uh, energized card at the start of my turn. Destroy one crystalline. It's gonna be this one. No! <laughs> Spend these three and make another crystalline. Alright, now the movement step. Alright, so first off, exploring. Uh, exploring here, I get a Rock Strider. Uh, and exploring, exploring here, I get a One Point Mine and a Crystal Mine. Alright, resolving combats. Uh, I'm going to resolve combats here first. Okay. So crystalline on crystalline. And yeah, we'll just go straight on there. Okay. I got a four, Jason got a two, however, I do not neither of us uh, succeed. I need at least a five plus. Next we're gonna go over here. So it's my Crestaline and Human versus Jason's uh, Rock Strider and Fungoid. So go to the Jason. Alright, so my Rock Strider goes first. He does not achieve a hit. I'm going to play an Energized card, Outflank. Uh, I get to choose two units uh, in the same space, which is going to be the two units I have there. And I get to actually add plus two to their die rolls until the end of this battle. So starting with the Crystalline there. Because the Crystalline hits on a four plus, in a crystal area, I have a good chance of making some damage here. That's a six, so Jason suffers a casualty. I'm going to remove my fungoid. All right, that means that Jason has actually denied his next attack because he's just lost that. And I'm gonna attack his rock strider. Well, I guess his rock strider is the only one left and I'm making an attack with my human. Still getting a plus two. Which is not enough. Next, I gain Rubium for all the areas I control and are uncontested. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Right. For the end of my round, I draw a secret mission card, and because I own the monolith right now, I get to draw two energized cards. And it is now uh, Jason's turn again. All right, Jay, that's, uh, that's Nexus Ops. Um, what did you think? Well, I mean, first of all, I really love the pieces that are included with this. Yep, cool like pieces. They, they're really cool. They they actually sparkle when you put them under the light. Yep. And if you actually have a black light, they, they actually glow. <laughs> Which is awesome. It, it's really cool. Speaking of black lights, ooh. Ah. Sparkly. Um, and, like, that shouldn't really be a selling point of the game is, like, little gimmicks like that, but it's still neat. It's just, like, one of those little, like, cute little things that you can kind of have on the side there. Um, one of the things I really enjoy about this game is that, uh, like, we haven't played as many games of this as we would have liked, and we actually had this discussion at the beginning of the review. But uh, this game is really, really simple. It's really, really easy. And uh, it's a lot of fun, too. The beautiful thing about it is that, like, once you actually get into the game... Um, you don't really need to refer to the rule book anymore. Uh, like once you know how to play, like either through like reading the rules, having them taught to you, or even if you just watch this video, video, that's it. That's all you need to know about the rules. The only time you'll ever need to refer to the rule book yeah. is if you have some sort of like weird conflicty thing, and even then, like it would probably just come down to like you know make it up sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But it's great. Um, even down to the fact that uh, like on the board, um, the. Uh, uh, places where only certain troops can go, like no humans are allowed here, and on the monolith no things are allowed, uh, a couple different troops aren't allowed there yeah. either. Um, they actually have those icons and like the information right right on the uh, the board there. And like a lot of people would argue that, you know, like, oh, well that distracts from the art of the game. But, I mean, fundamentally you're there to play the game, not the art. Although and I... It's, it's just really helpful to have it there so that you, you actually know. It's, absolutely, yeah. yeah. I'm all for like, you know, good art and games and everything like that, but you're there for the games. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
Now this is going to be kind of a broken record thing, but oh, here we go. Un unfortunately there was no expansion released for this, and uh, you know, I, again, I think that especially this game, uh, it could have used an expansion. It uses hex tiles and everything, all of that. So would have been easy to expand. Uh, it, it, it would have been easy to do, and of course Avalon Hill does not do that. So yeah. <sighs> Dear Avalon Hill, I own many of your games and have an internet show where I talk about them. While I love your games, it concerns me about your complete lack of expansion sports at games and your seeming unwillingness to support your games aside from Axis and Allies. In conclusion, please consider releasing expansions for these games. Sincerely, Jason. Dear valued customer, we appreciate your concern for our lack of expansions. However, you have to remember that our prime was before the age of board games that we are in now. Asking for an expansion for these games would be like asking for an expansion for Monopoly, or like Scrabble. Besides, most of our funding is redirected into Magic the Gathering and Dungeons and Dragons. Sincerely, Avalon Hill. P.S. Have you tried our new Axis and Allies Atlantis edition? It's pretty awesome! Um, anyway, uh, so, yeah, another thing about this game is that, um, it's... Like many games that have uh, secret missions, it's like really hard to... Oh, you had to bring that up, didn't you? Look, okay. <laughs> I know that I've gone... I've touched on this before. I've raged out a little bit about this. I hate Risk. <laughs> so many people love this game. I hate it. It's so boring. You play Dice Masturbation, the board game, for like 10 days straight. It's insane. I can't... Like, I, okay. I'm I'm not sure. banning on anybody's fun. Ever. Okay. Yeah. Show. Okay. Show. Show. Okay. Okay, like so many games that have secret missions, like Risk, if you are not familiar with what the secret missions are that people are trying to fulfill, it's kind of hard to thwart them. Um, you get into points where someone leads you into something and just suddenly like, boom, I got a secret mission card, I, I get victory points, now I've suddenly won the game. And it's like, okay, well that was sort of just came out of nowhere. Well, yeah, and, and the other thing, too, is, you know, if, if somebody's played the game a lot, they kind of have an idea of what all the secret mission cards are. Yeah, which so, is... So, you know, that's kind of a little unfair, because then the other player doesn't really know what to look for. For sure, and I mean, like, really, when it comes down to it, like, it's not like it's a deck of, like, a bunch of different unique secret missions. Like, there's a bunch of repeated ones in here. Um, I think what I would have liked to see with this game, because they have the deck of just, like, plain missions, um... It would have been nice if the ones they call secret missions were actually just those plain missions cards. Um, where, like, you could just, like, I don't know, draw a couple of those in the run of a turn or something like that. But then, like, there was a deck of just, like, actual secret mission cards where, like, it was really hard to figure out what each player was actually kind of getting at. Mm -hmm. and, and, like, perhaps, like, maybe you could, like, build all your blah troops and control blah areas or something like that. Well, yeah, something um, a little bit more interesting anyway. Like, a little bit more advanced. But again, like, the whole, whole point of this game is to keep it nice and simple, as, like, I've already said. And that's a good thing. So it's... We don't really want to make the game too much more complicated, but at the same time, it's nice to have a little bit more, um, a little bit more variation, a little bit more intrigue. Yeah. Yep. All right, Ken, so what would you give this? All right, Nexus Ops. Um, I'm going to have to go with a four out of five. It's a good game. It's a fun game. It's easy to learn. Um, it's not a perfect game, though. It's, it's a little, a little too simple in some places. I like the fact that it's an easy, simple game. It's very easy to get people into this. But um, not a lot of people have heard of it, um, and it's it's not fair to knock a game for that. Um, but uh, at the same time, I like that just kind of reflects back on uh, Avalon Hill. Um, overall, though, I like what they were doing with this game. I can kind of see that they were sort of trying to make a nice little blend between like Settlers of Catan and uh, Starcraft. So I think that they, they they did a good job in doing that. But it's still just a little too vanilla for my taste. I would like it to be just a little, little bigger. Maybe a little uh, the options for having it be a little bit more complicated, a little bit more intricate. Um, what do you think, Jason? Uh, I'd also give it a four out of five. Yeah. I mean, I, I I do really like the game. It's it's a good game. No, it's a nice, quick and simple game. For sure. But uh, you know, again, Avalon Hill doesn't really support it anymore. Anymore. Uh, it's it's relatively hard to find in most gaming stores. You know. This is another thing too. It's pretty hard to find a fine game. Yeah. Uh, so you know, it, it just was a point in my books there. Mm -hmm. Well, that's gonna give us a grand total of eight meeples. So that's all for today, and uh, join us next time for Shadows Over Camelot. See you next time, and have good games. Hi, my name is Ken. And my name is Jason. And today we're reviewing... 
Borgasm. Wait a second, Jason. Borgasm isn't a game. Sure it is. It's a lot of games. Ah, you're right. Borgasm is actually a day for new and veteran gamers to meet together and play games. If you're local to the Halifax area or looking to uh, hang out with some uh, people who are looking to play some board games, uh, you can join us at the Dell Student Union Building on July 16th from 12 to 9. Registration at the door will be $10, and if you pre-register through our website, it is only $8. And if you're a member of the Nova Scotia Board Gaming Society, you get a dollar off of the entry to all events, which includes this one. As always, we are also looking for some volunteers to run board games oh, at uh, BG, so if you're interested, please contact us. That's right, and uh, if you want to join the Nova Scotia Board Gaming Society, you can do that online, or we'll actually be accepting new memberships at the Boardgasm uh, event on July 16th. For more information on any of this, please check out www.boardgasm.org. Hope to see you there, and hope you have good games.